What is deception? Well, in the English, deception is the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. The act of deceiving, falsehood. Deceive in the Hebrew is nasha, which is to beguile, to deceive, lead astray, and to delude. Deception is an epidemic in America and around the world, particularly in the free world. Deception is a rule of the day with a majority of people, maybe even an overwhelming majority of people, being deceived. They are lulled into it because they're no longer able to discern truth from lies, or in some cases, they actually want to believe the deception because it fits a personal narrative or agenda. You know, it's hard for me to comprehend that socialism and communism is gaining favor in America. We had the unique opportunity, Rabison and I, almost 20 years ago, for a number of years, we were traveling to the former Soviet Union nations two or three times a year. We've been in Moldova, we've been in Ukraine, we've been in Russia, Siberia, Hungary. And I cannot begin to place into words the dysfunction of those places after less than two generations of communism, 70 years. It only lasted 70 years. You don't know what fear is until you get in a Russian elevator. You quickly learn how to pray. Hitler was a socialist. Let me say that again. Hitler was a socialist. I have another term for this. I call it the dumbing down of America. Deception is so ingrained into our greater American culture and society today that I hardly know where to begin or even where to start talking about this. We have overwhelming deception in our society, our culture, our ethics and religion, government, and our justice system. Deception is prevalent in our media, and there's great deception even in the curriculum of our schools and universities. Yeshua tells us in John 8, that Hasetan, he's the inventor, he's the author of all lies. Hasetan is also referred to as the deceiver, the source of deception in Revelation 12, starting at verse 9. We just can't get out of this Revelation 12 message. The great dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent, also known as the devil, and Satan, Hasetan, the adversary, the deceiver. Plan Ao in the Greek, which means to deceive, one led astray from the right way, mental strain, air, wrong opinion relative to morals or the word of God. Wow. You can just underline that. That sums it all up. It goes on to say air, which shows itself in action. Thoughts become sin. Sin, be, sin turns into action. Or action turns into sin. I'm sorry. A wrong mode of acting, deceit, fraud, delusion. So the deceiver of the whole world, and he was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. As you know, deception has invaded into our own government. It's always been there lurking in the background, but it's now out front. Shockingly, this week in the news, Republican Ilhan Omer from Minnesota, a Muslim elected to the House of Representatives during the November 2018 midterms, posted a series of tweets last Sunday, <laughs> incredibly anti-Semitic. Omar is one of two newly elected Muslim women serving in the House. To leave the other, both have come under fire recently for their anti-Semitic tweets, but yet not been asked to step down from the boards they serve on. Last Sunday, our own governor was interviewed by CBS on a morning news show called This Morning. And I want to quote from the Daily Press, an article that was printed this past February 12th, just past Tuesday. And the article was, the headline was, here's what historians have to say about Northam's indentured servants comment. It says, and I'm quoting in his first TV interview since becoming mired in scandal over a racist yearbook photo governed Governor Ralph Northam stirred another controversy, this time dating back 400 years. Now, a week ago tonight, we were just talking about this. 
Just 90 miles from here in 1619, and he was in Richmond. It's not 90 miles for us. The first indentured servants from Africa landed on our shores. This is exactly what he, he said in Old Point Comfort, what we call now Fort Monroe. He said in a nationally televised interview with CBS's Gail King Sunday night. That's when King quickly interjected, calling it slavery. And Northam said yes and moved on. But the commentators did not, which is correct. Indentured servitude is typically defined as temporary, one way for people to pay off their passage to the new world in a period of work. Slavery, on the other hand, was permanent. I would say this is consistent with what we've seen from Northam over the past two weeks in terms of these responses that are overlooking the anti-black racism that is foundational to slavery in the history of this country. And this is from Allison Page, an assistant professor of media studies at Old Dominion University, who studies the representation of slavery in U.S. media culture. There's another term for this. We call it revisionist history, which is deception. It's taking the facts of what actually happened and retelling the story to change the narrative. Revisionist historians tell us the founding fathers were deists, vice believers. Southern slave owners didn't refer to slavery as slavery. They called it that peculiar institution. There's a subversive revisionist history push to claim that the Civil War was about state rights issues, vice slavery. Revisionist historians teach that Truman authorized the nuclear bombing of Japan to flex our muscles and show Russia what we really had. Vice the fact in his own handwriting that it would prevent over a million U.S. casualties by a mainland invasion. Listen, and even more disturbing, I read another article this week. I can't believe this. Our nation is becoming awash with drag queen story hours at local public and school libraries. Men garishly adorned and dressed as women. Deception. Read LGBTQ-themed books to young children under the guise of performing a public service. Recently, these drag queen story hours have occurred in Evansville, Indiana, Astoria, Oregon, Houston, Texas, and Mobile, Alabama. And unbelievably, the American Library Association proudly endorses these events. They even have a web page dedicated to their promotion. The obvious goal here is to deceive an entire generation of children that transvestites are perfectly normal. Many of these drag queens have admitted themselves that their goal is to groom the next generation. Listen, in just the past 25 years alone, not even an entire generation, the greater body of Messiah in America has experienced an overwhelmingly increase in lawlessness, permissiveness, and selfishness. Immoral behavior that was unacceptable just a few decades ago are now mainstream culture. Believing leaders involved in same-sex marriage, involved in sexual sin, dabbling in pornography, and the body is suffering an explosive divorce rate. There are some polls that suggest the divorce rate is higher in the body of Messiah than outside. All of these factors have led to a rapid decrease of morals among believers in America. A recent survey among millennials revealed a staggering statistic. The percentage who follow biblically-based values for living has dropped from 65% to a mere 4% since the post-World War II generation. So in the late 40s and early 50s, 65% of the population lived biblical-based values. It's less than 4% today. There has never been a society in the history of mankind whose moral values have shockingly eroded and deteriorated so drastically, so dramatically, in such a short period of time as those of America. And as of right now, it shows no sign of stopping. These statistics serve to warn us that something is terribly wrong with the greater body. There's widespread deception. The true good news, the gospel of Messiah Yeshua, is not being communicated to mainstream America, which is why we suffer so much deception in our culture. And again, it's getting worse. Ironically, it's nothing new. Let's look at a parable Yeshua gave us in Luke 16, starting at verse 19. 
Once there was a rich man who used to dress in the most expensive clothing and spend his days in magnificent luxury. And at his gate had been laid a beggar named Eleazar who was covered with sores. He would have been glad to eat the scraps that fell from this rich man's table, but instead even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Verse 22, in time the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, in Sheol, where he was in torment. The rich man looked up and saw Abraham far away with Eleazar at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Eleazar just to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. However, Abraham said, Son, remember that when you were alive, you got the good things while he got the bad. But now he gets his consolation here while you are the one in agony. But that's forever. Verse 26, yet that isn't all. Between you and us, a deep rift. It actually says chasm, chasm in the Greek, has been established so that those who would like to pass from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. It's impossible. You're either in the smoking section or the non-smoking section. Verse 27, he answered, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, where I have five brothers to warn them, so that they may be spared having to come to this place of torment too. But Avram said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should shma, they should listen to them. Right. However, he said, no, Father Avram, they need more. If someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. Verse 31, but he replied, if they won't listen to Moshe and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. My God, this speaks directly to us today. Nothing new under the sun. Listen, the dead rich man is shocked. He's surprised to find himself in Sheol, in hell. Listen to me. 2,000 years ago, contemporary Judean culture equated wealth with godliness. 2,000 years ago in Judea, it was thought that the richer you are, the more favored of Adonai you are. Thereby, the rich man believed the Lord favored him. He made an assumption. We all know what happens when you assume. One cannot assume in the kingdom of God. In fact, that's a contemporary problem in America today. We're the top 5% richest people in the world. We just don't know it. And so we look at the top 0.2% of those richest people say, well, I don't I have this. How come I don't have those things? You've got that in a million times more. The rich man thought he was headed to heaven. He thought he had a one-way ticket. This cultural misunderstanding from 2,000 years ago, listen, listen to this very carefully. It reveals why the Talmudim, they're shocked and amazed when Yeshua makes this statement in Matthew 19. Verse 24, he says, furthermore, I tell you that it's easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is completely 180 out culturally from the understanding among the elite in Judea 2,000 years ago. And how do I know this? Look at, the, look at verse 25. When the Talmud Bedin heard this, they were utterly amazed. Boo, what? Going to heaven's got nothing to do with my money? Yet there's people alive today who still think that way. Then who, they ask, can be saved? Contemporary culture was dictating and establishing mainstream moral standards and ethics through deception. It was happening then, and it's happening now. This has been going on for more than 2,000 years. We did only look inward regarding our own history. To study how the body of Messiah became separated from that Jewish olive tree with a stern warnings not to do so in Romans 11. This deception has been unfolding for the last 2,000 years through supersessionism and false teaching, religions and denial or suppression of Scripture. Listen, how can America 
the greatest republic that has enjoyed the profound blessings from the Most High God, a nation that allegedly reports a large percentage of its population to be born-again believers, how can we be spiraling downward, out of control, into a state of wickedness, sin, depravity, and immorality? Well, Yeshua told us it would be that way. Again, Matthew 24, starting at verse 23, says, At that time, if someone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe him. For there will appear false messiahs and false prophets performing great miracles. He said amazing things. So as to fool even the chosen, if possible. He says, there, I've told you in advance. The elect of God are deceived in our hour, in our day today. Yeshua's own words reveal the end days are rife with great deception and tribulation, combined with what? False prophets, false messiahs, and false teachings. Confusion and deception will reign, and it is reigning. And what's even more interesting about Yeshua's statement, what really stands out concerning these false prophets and false messiahs, are these great miracles, amazing things, are capable of deceiving even the chosen if possible. How could it be? How could it be? Because a dead and dying body that's void of miracles, void of signs and wonders, paves the way for the great end-time deception because of apostasy from the truth, resulting in a grievous and profound lack of supernatural signs and wonders within the body today. It's so dry and so dead that when a false something comes along and appears to do something supernatural, <gasps> I challenge you. Flip through the TV God on cable. Start paying attention to what the overwhelming majority of the themes are. Aliens. Aliens that planted life here on this earth. UFOs, the paranormal. Come on, Bigfoot. There's four or five shows where they're necromancing and trying to speak to the dead. I mean, there's a large majority of this on television. Why is that? Because people are, they desire the supernatural, but they're filling it with junk food. So then something comes along and, oh, look at that, it looks supernatural. Oh, you bet they're going to fall for it. They already are. It may already be happening. Your cable TV may be the anti-Messiah. Listen to me very carefully. This is going to sound harsh for a second. In the Akhirat Hayamim, in that time and season to come, which I believe is today, people will be fooled because they want to be. In the Akhirat Hayamim, people will be fooled because they want to be. Truth is obtainable today. You can find out the truth. It's amazing to me that the internet is one of the most grievous demonic tools ever invented, and yet at the same time is one of the most profound sources of knowledge and understanding ever invented. I've shared this before. To know what you know today, us in here right now collectively, to understand and have the knowledge and know what you know today just 60 years ago would have taken a lifetime. You'd have to travel to libraries around the world and go in the bowels of monasteries and churches and dig through 3,000-year-old documents and 2,000-year-old documents with white gloves and learn five languages. My Lord, all the entire scrolls of Qumran are online and they're all translated. All you have to do is click. You today have one of the most profound accesses to knowledge and wisdom than any other generation in human history. And yet we're the most deceived people on the earth ever known within human history. What an oxymoron. It's the easiest to get the truth today than ever before, but instead we rely on what? Social media. We rely on gossip and slander and rumors. We're being fed lies every day in the media system, and we go, okay, whatever you say.
Truth is obtainable today. Facts can be had, yet people don't. People are deceived because they want to be. People will believe the false signs and wonders they witness because they want, they seek, they believe the deception. And I have to tell you, deception is often easier than truth. Because deception allows you to stay exactly where you're at. Truth requires something to change. And change always starts where? With you, the individual, in your heart. The deception is more palatable because you don't have to change. Religion, theology, even education cannot prevent this. Actually, they compound the deception and confusion, causing even more people to apostatize. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. The Spirit, the Ruach, expressly states, that means emphatically, clearly communicates, that in the accurate Hayamim, some people will apostatize from the faith by paying attention to deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. How, how many times have you read that? Yes, apostasy, okay, I get it. But the Ruach emphatically states that it will be done by deceiving spirits, deception, and things taught by demons. It's readily apparent to anyone who's awake and, pray, and paying attention that we are engaged in full-scale war, Amen. physically and spiritually. While most of the body of Messiah is apathetic, asleep, or at best aware it's going on, but they're not engaged, not getting in the battle. Listen, where's the outcry over the anti-Semitic tweets from these two Muslim Congress people? It's been silent in the newspapers. Very few headlines about this. Our own governor who inaccurately portrayed the first slave to America 400 years ago. What a disgrace. Yet he publicly states he knows what Virginia needs. I watched an interview. He says, well, I got a lot to offer. I We'll get over this. I know, what the, I know what Virginia needs. I'll tell you what it doesn't need. It doesn't need any more falsehood or deceptions. Listen, my real, my real issue here, we all make mistakes. I'm not on a soapbox. I'm not casting stones. I got a closet full of mistakes in my life. I'm telling you I've made mistakes. You know it. I've made mistakes on the BIM. I've stood right here and apologized for things I've incorrectly taught in the last 19 years. Truth is more important than deception and pride. Come on. My issue with this is, he admitted it was him. And then when the Fuhrer rose to resign, oh, well, you know, power corrupts. I can't step down for it. Uh, after me meditating upon this for a while, uh, I don't, it wasn't me. <laughs> and they know what's best for us. Well, the obvious question is what can we do? Why does this happen? Why is America and the world in a fast, one-track downward spiral towards moral anarchy and self-destruction? Why do the Muslims, the anarchists, the pagans, the homosexuals, the atheists, every other counter-biblical minority group seems to win victory after victory after victory? They get the headlines. They get the press. They get the TV interviews. They're on social media. News media, entertainment. You can't watch a show or a movie that somewhere they got to slip this in. There's, there is an agenda. Everywhere you look, they seem to be taking over this republic. What can we do? We can fight. 
1 Timothy 1, starting at verse 18. This charge, son, Timothy, I put to you, in keeping what the prophecies already made about you, so that by these prophecies you may fight. Fight. Strat you ome, which to make a military expedition, to lead soldiers to war or to battle, to do military duty, to be on active service, to be a soldier, to fight. He said, so by these prophecies that have been given to you, we've been hearing these prophecies here for 19 years. And what do we do with these? We've been charged to what? To fight. To fight the good fight. Stratia, which is the root word of stratiome, which means an expedition, a campaign, a military service. It means warfare. Shaul likens his contest with the difficulties that oppose him in the discharge of his apostolic duties as warfare. Paul read tonight the longest prayer list we've ever had as a congregation. Ever. That thing's a page and a half. We got to rally the troops. We got to go to war. There's an onslaught. Again, I shared this last week. I'm not rehashing last week's message, although I'd like to. There's a reason why the eyes of the nation are upon us, because it's time to rise up and to fight. It's time to fight back. It's time to push back. Adonai took us, Israel, on a longer journey out of Egypt to Mount Sinai than it was required. Do you know why? It was to shield us from war. When we first departed slavery in Egypt, we weren't ready. Slaves don't know how to fight. Last week I spoke about things that aren't always as they appear to be focused. And this took place at Rephidim, the water coming out of the rock. And as we, Israel, continued on in Exodus, heading towards Mount Sinai to meet and hear from God, we encountered violence. We encountered a force, a nation that sought to destroy us. The Amalekites attacked the fledgling nation of Israel. Exodus 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at where? Rephidim. Huh. This situation wasn't our first encounter with a violent army or from a violent, oppressive, and aggressive government. When, Israel, when Egypt released us, Israel, from slavery after that tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, we departed joyously singing, took all the gold and riches of the land. We sacked the nation. And yet, here we are now, just upon the departure trap between Pharaoh's mighty army and the Sea of Suf, the Red Sea. And a very, very bitter and angry Pharaoh, he's leading the charge of this world's most technologically advanced army, screaming towards us in these chariots. But in that situation, right then and there, we Israel, we didn't fight. We didn't fight. We panicked. We turned to Moses. Oh, you brought us out here to die. What are we to do? And Moses turned to God and says, what are we to do? What did you do? And, and God answers back to Moses and says, use the staff. I gave you the staff. You got everything you need. Get the staff. Pick it up. And when he did, the Red Sea parts. And we walked across on what? Dry ground to the other side. God can do anything. There's a whole other message here. He's given us the staff. We've already got it. i just gone on for 20 minutes about all the issues, and we're all feeling, oh, my, what are we going to do? Fight! Pick up the staff! Let the supernatural be released! But here at this situation, we didn't fight. We panicked. So why doesn't God destroy Amalek when they attack Israel? In Exodus 17, starting in verse 9, Moshe said to Yehoshua, Choose men for us. Go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with God's staff in my hand. Verse 10, Yehoshua did as Moshe had told him and fought with Amalek. Then Moshe, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When Moshe raised his hand, Israel prevailed. But when he let it down, Amalek prevailed. 
However, Moshe's hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held up his hands, that one on one side and the other on the other, so that his hands stayed steady until sunset. That is a long time. We do roughly 20 minutes of worship. I don't see anybody in the entire 20 minutes holding their hands up. They'd start shaking. You'd get sore after a while. Then hold a staff and do it. Verse 13, thus Jehoshua defeated Amalek, putting their people to the sword. Verse 14, Adonai said to Moshe, write this in a book to be remembered and tell it to Jehoshua. I will completely blot out any memory of Amalek from under heaven. This is the first time or place in Torah that Israel is commanded to write something down in a document or a scroll. This is very interesting. And it was to be recorded for all future generations generations to memorialize. This was commanded before the giving of Torah. This is before Mount Sinai, which is a few chapters later. And what was to be recorded? We fight. Adonai was with us in this battle, but he didn't fight it this time. He commanded us to go out and fight. That day we put Amalek to the sword and we won the battle. From this battle on, we had to fight for every inch of soil in the promised land. We had to fight future attacks from the Philistines, the Amalekites, the Midianites, the Moabites, Hagarites, Ammonites, the name just a of few, as well as the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greek Syrians, then the Romans, then the contemporary nations of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, and a made-up group of people called Palestinians. As soon as we declared our independence, May 14, 1948, we fought. And we fought numerous wars. And the restoration of Jerusalem back into our hands, we had to fight for it. With few exceptions, almost every battle since this first one in Exodus 17, though God is with us, we must pick up the knife, the sword, the bow, the spear, the rifle, the devour, the glock, the word of God, and we must fight. Why is that? Why doesn't he just give it to us? Well, all you need to do is look at our contemporary generation to see what happens when everything is just given to you. Something not earned is something not respected. Why do we have to do this? I want to share what I believe will be some surprising answers. First, it's ownership. Fighting prevents a welfare state. After having every need provided for us in Egypt for over 200 years, we'd become comfortable in our slavery. We don't want to leave the system. Look at our habitual, you know, we had leeks and watermelons and garlic and fish back in Egypt. We didn't have to eat this manna every day. They were slaves. You could take them out of Egypt, but you couldn't take the Egypt out of them. America's current infatuation with socialism and communism is our most dangerous threat to date. Warfare has another profound impact on people and societies. It brings about unity, a chad, a completeness, and oneness. I've done dozens of messages about unity over the years, and it's very clear that God desires unity, and Hasitan desires division. James 1, verse 4 says, But let perseverance, hupaone, steadfastness, endurance, perseverance, to persevere under misfortunes and trials, let perseverance do its complete work, so that you may be complete, whole, and lacking in nothing. One of the most supernatural times we had as a congregation is when the Nazis came to town. 2005, the Nazis came to Surrender Field in Yorktown. I've shared this story several times over the years. Very profound. We had inside people at the, at the park. They called, told us the Nazis. Rabbi, you know the Nazis are coming? They are. And we stood our ground and we fought. And we got a lot of outside flack. I had pastors come to me, what's wrong with you? People could get hurt. 
They're Nazis. We lost six million of our people to the Robins. You're darn tootin' we're going to go march, and we're going to go stand out there until they go away. We learned our lesson in 1933. You can't stick your head in the sand from aggression and hatred. It will never go away. It has to be confronted every time. But uniquely, it pulled us together as a congregation. Things were never the same after the Nazis came to town. This manifestation of the echad, the binded together, this unity, is love for the Lord and for each other. To persevere under misfortunes and trials means you've got to fight. Warfare in the spirit, warfare in the flesh. Through the sacrifice of Yeshua, God has made us Jew and Gentile one, echad, a new man. But even more importantly, this unity, this echad has given us complete access in one spirit to the Father. We can arm ourselves, we can have chariots, we can have tanks and aircraft carriers, we can have nuclear weapons. But when the face of God looks out from the pillar of fire, nothing can withstand. Nothing can withstand. This oneness, this unity, it releases the power of God. Remember, it's what Hasetan absolutely detests, loathes, and despises. By receiving the blood sacrifice of Yeshua, we are saved. You're saved by the blood. And this blood covenant provides us with three specific covenant effects in our life in this world. Number one, you're marked territory. Listen to me. You are marked territory. This is why that saved by grace message is so dangerous. You are saved by the blood, and that blood makes you marked territory. When we were in Egypt, we didn't put grace on the doorpost. We put the blood. And the blood is what staved off the angel of death. When you're marked territory, when that blood is on your lintel and doorpost, the demons cannot touch you. Let me say that again. The demons cannot touch you. You are marked territory. Listen, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Hasetan, he goes about like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Listen to me very carefully. Lions don't attack in the center of the herd. They prey upon the fringes. They're looking for the old, the infirm, the young, the weak. That's what Satan does. So this is incumbent upon us to strengthen up, to gird up. Number two, blessings are restored through the blood. We receive complete health and well-being, wisdom and provision. Blessings are restored through the blood. The covenant is restored. Number three, The blood covenant gives us spirit leading and direction. We are shown the path to walk for righteousness, purity, and holy discernment. Holy discernment defeats deception. Holy discernment defeats deception. There's been so many times in our 19 and a half years, I can't put my thumb on it. I can't make it illicit in words. But whatever I'm up against or who I'm dealing with, I know it's wrong. And I don't have to know what it is. I just have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and say, nope. This is not for us. It's not for me. It's not for my family. I can't tell you how many times, years later, we find out it was complete nonsense. It was even demonic. Through these three covenant effects given to us through the blood of Yeshua, we have complete and total victory over the enemy in all areas of deception and welfare. Let us go back to Romans or Revelation 12, 11 one more time. They defeated him by the Lamb's blood. Come on! We're so caught up in the counterfeit grace, we've completely ignored the power of the blood. They defeated him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the message of their witness. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and love not their lives even unto death. This mishpocha is what's missing from the body. The desire to fight, the desire to say no, the buck stops right here. we got to draw the line in the sand. Forgiveness is only through the blood. It's the guarantor we are forgiven. The blood is a divine covenant shield against demonic attack. The blood of Yeshua is saying we are not condemned as stronger than the demonic voice of condemnation. Can I say that again? The blood of Yeshua saying you are not condemned is stronger than the demonic voice of condemnation. 
It's stronger than the voice of sexual identity and misconfusion. It's stronger than the orphan generation. It's stronger than abandonment. It's stronger than divorces. It's stronger than homosexuality. It's stronger than lawlessness and deception. Using the spiritual power through the blood of Yeshua, we can and do have the victory. Yeshua said in John 16, Satan's already defeated. But it must be placed on the doorposts of our bodies, our minds, and our souls. And when we understand these advantages of the covenant blood, we can trust, activate, and release His divine power in our lives. There's unlimited power in the blood of Yeshua. And through it, we can overcome every demonic attack, all the sicknesses of, of Egypt. We can overcome cancer, sickness. We can overcome poverty. We can overcome transsexual relationships. There's nothing we can't overcome by the blood of the Lamb. It restores righteousness and purity. It can remove hate. It can restore relationships. So many in need of surgery, sick, attacked by the sicknesses of Egypt. It's time to fight. By his stripes we are healed. By his bruising, iniquities are destroyed. By that blood we are restored and set free. Let's rise. I want our prayer teams to come. See, this is the key focal point. Maybe you're here this evening and you've never been restored through that blood sacrifice unto Father God. This is ground zero. This is level 101 of the fight we're fighting. We have to be restored to the king through the prince. You have to receive that blood sacrifice as your own. You've got to put it on the doorposts of your heart and on the lintels of your heart that you too may be set free just as we were set free, both physically and spiritually. If you're here tonight, you have said the prayer, you have received that sacrifice, now it's time to activate the blood. It's time to release its power within you and through you. We've got to fight. Look at me. We've got to fight. We can't dance around the mountain of Sinai anymore. The shofar sounding time is up. It's time to fight. I don't want to wait two weeks for the conference. I want to start right now. I want to lay into this right now. The blood separates you from the curse. Whatever struggle you're dealing with, the blood's the answer. Whatever relational issue you've got, the blood's the answer. Whatever physical ailment you've got, the blood's the answer. Whatever condemnation, whatever shame you've got, the blood's the answer. Father, right now in Yeshua's name, Holy Spirit, come. Speak to every soul, every spirit here now or those watching. As we say tonight, Hanani, Hanani. Let us understand the power of the blood. The blood removes all deception. These are blood issues we're dealing with in our nation. Father, give us understanding. Yeshua, open our minds that we can comprehend. And Father, help us tonight, right now, to put every issue under the blood. For life, healing, and restoration. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. And amen.